No, 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 you can't shoot. Okay, we are back live at VMworld. <laughs> Always chatting with Simon Crosby. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com. We're here with Simon Crosby, the legend, the myth in person. <laughs> um, you know, Simon, great to have you on theCUBE. I think we had our first uh, CUBE interview um, at Citrix Synergy where you were uh, an executive over there. What was your official title at Citrix? CTO? I was CTO for Data Center and Cloud. Yeah, yep. exactly. So, you know, we have, uh, a shout out to John Barra, my friend, who I saw last night at Barbecue. You guys worked at Zen together. You know the open source world. You know what's going on in the trenches around virtualization. So, a couple things. You left Citrix to work on a startup, Bromium. Okay, I got you to plug in at uh, EMC World with Pat Gelsinger. So share with the folks on Simon Crosby, the update on you personally, what you've been up to, uh, and then let's talk a little bit about some of the, the tech that you're involved in. Okay, thanks John. Um, so myself, Ian Pratt, who's the chairman of Zen.org, who you remember, and Gaurav Banga, who was the CTO at Phoenix, um, we started a company called Bromium, and um, so this is, this, it's virtualization centric, but uh, virtualization unlike any virtualization you've ever heard of before. Um, the company by now is 50 people in five countries, and uh, we're in beta two with our first product, and we're having an, an awesome amount of fun. So obviously you've been banned from VMworld in the past because you were a competitor technically. Right. Um, and we got you in here for theCUBE. Um, but now you're, you, you're now potentially a supplier to the people that you were once competing with. How's that feel for you? Um, you know, I, I, what's what changed we did, what in the we, marketplace? Yeah, what we're doing is somewhat different, but you know, now with, with VMware having bought Nasira, you know, and, and uh, Cloud Foundry and being a good open source citizen and everything else, I think they're doing a great job. Um, you know, VMware is still very much enterprise data center centric. Uh, where I intersect with VMware is in the area of view, Citrix also with Zen Desktop. And you know, most large enterprises have got some desktop virtualization going on, but the vast majority of desktops are not. They're like that. And, uh, and users want awesome devices, and enterprises want awesome productive users who are secure, right? So, so what, just uh, while you're here, I must get your commentary on the analysis of the Pat Gelsinger uh, and uh, Maritz Skino. Obviously, both Maritz is highly regarded, and deservedly so, he's a great guy, technologist. Yeah. Uh, you can see he's just kind of punching out to do some cooler things right. than be the CEO, and most tech geeks don't want to be the CEO because it kind of gets boring. Right. They oper have to do operational things, and Pat loves the operations side, but he announced some price pricing changes. I mean, you saw that coming, so it's a good move for VMware, yeah. what's your take all on good. that? No, all, all good, I, I think the Nasir acquisition was also very, very strategic. Also the, uh, you know, the, the, everything that they've done in general from an orchestration perspective, it's all smart, they're doing, they're doing a fabulous job, there's no doubt about it. So obviously Spring Source is now two years old, we saw, what's his name, Rod, leave the, leave the company. Obviously that's a classic case of, you know, I sold the company, I'm going to fly out of here. Uh, lights are flickering, transformers are blowing, probably from the big screen. Um, so, you know, open source is not uh, new to VMware, but they've now two years into the spring, spring acquisition, and the developer community is changing. What do you see on, at the, in the developer community right now? Um, obviously, mobile is the hottest thing. You've seen consumerization of IT, all that stuff. What's your angle on so the I think, developers look, I, th I think that the whole world, by the way, this includes Microsoft, has suddenly finally figured out that open source is not you know, it, it's not a, it, it's just another way of developing software. That any large company's portfolio should include open source software. Even Microsoft now does, you know, got the yeah. whole division set up to do it. And so where it makes sense to embrace and, and work with communities when it's in your interest to do so. Okay, great, so now we've got past this, you know, big fuss about everything has to be open source for either religious reasons or I want to look at the source code or whatever it is. That's all nonsense, it's just, turns out that for some things, it's a great way to develop software. Open source is growing up too. I mean, you know, we've been around the block, our, you know, we're old enough to know, we've seen all the generations of open source yeah. now. It's, it's maturing, and, and still, but still growing. Um, Look, the, 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 the cloud, right, the, the public cloud, is 100% fueled by open source software. But, you know, it's, it's open source software that's been taken by vendors and turned into proprietary software. Yeah, good for them. Yeah. For them, that's their yeah. business model. Well, and it's, and it's legal. So. <laughs> okay, so let's talk, so again, love it. So, uh, you know, we talked about this about the public cloud and now hybrids and all this stuff. But let's talk about um, your thing now, your technology. I know yeah. you've got a product announcement <coughs> coming up in the first week of September, or right after VMworld, you're going to do a product announcement, give or take. I, I think we're going to be under embargo for that. Uh, you, I got, I've heard some specifics, um, but it's kind of in the sweet spot of what they laid out here as an architecture. It's the network and security 
discussions going on well, in, in the actually, middle of the stack? Or is know, it or is it? I'll just go back to cloud then for a minute. Um, you would never, ever, ever put an enterprise application in a cloud that was not um, multi-tenant safe. Right? You just wouldn't do it. And so then let's think about the desktop for a second. How many tenants are there on the desktop? You might say, well, there's me and there's the enterprise. There's two? Uh-uh. It's not two. Every time I click on a URL, I get a blob of JavaScript thrown back at me from some website, which executes locally. So that website is a tenant of my PC, right? Mm -hmm. So then the question is, well, how good is your desktop at multi-tenancy? How good is it? It's pathetic. Yeah. It's pathetic. It's pathetic, yeah. Okay. It's not designed for that. Right. And so the operating systems that we use today were designed were not designed to be attacked 24 by 7, right? And the average user is connected 24 by 7. They're out somewhere, not on a wired LAN. And they're on a SaaS or PaaS or some platform. There's something. Okay. And they're trying to access cloud applications. And so the challenge is for the enterprise, how can you reason about the trustworthiness of anything? That is, if a device has ever gone into Starbucks, whether it's yours or theirs, should you ever allow it on the network again? And the answer is no. Yeah. You shouldn't. So ultimately, you know, this, if you look at what's going on in desktop virtualization, desktop virtualization kind of helps, but it kind of also doesn't solve the problem which, say, for example, RSA had last year where the RSA certs were stolen, right? Okay, somebody, that. Okay, so somebody clicks on a bad attachment. I know enough about you that I could easily craft an attack that would make you click on it. Yeah. Okay, and the attacker will do that. And in a clever way more than the, hey, someone's talking about you on the internet, some obvious yeah. hack. That's an obvious hack, but you're talking about more clever, yes. a more cleverly designed, see this attachment. Yes, so, so a determined attacker knows enough about you to create an attack, and, and so you will click on it, and because a human wrote the code, there's always going to be another zero day. Okay, so here's what we just said. Our computer systems are not designed to deal with our humanity, because I'm gullible, and the guy who wrote the code was fallible. Okay, and this is a major failing. So it's high time we started to build systems that were much more resilient by design. And so Bromium is doing that. So can you give any tease sure. out about the product? I can tell you, let me tell you what, how the system works then. So essentially, um, it, given that I'm gullible and that somebody left bugs in the code, what can we do? So what you can do is this. Essentially, we're a magic hypervisor. Um, which means we need Intel VT. Every time you launch a task, you click on a URL, you open a document, open an attachment, whatever it happens to be, we're going to instantly isolate that into a tiny uh, hardware virtualized micro VM. So we're going to use all of the machinery of Intel VT, not for a running virtual machine, but for isolating tasks within a running operating system. Okay, this is the bit that I'm sure you heard doesn't work. It's impossible to make yeah. it work. Yeah. Okay, so instead of using VT to run lots of VMs, use it on the fly instantly within 10 milliseconds or so, completely unseen by the user to, to isolate a task. Okay, so you click on a link in Twitter, and I've got to put that thing into a box. And that box is going to be an Intel VT isolator box, which then operates with two additional key uh, um, properties, one of them is that it executes copy on write. So if the bad guy happens to end up in that micro VM and tries to stomp on the system, then all the changes that he makes will be local to the micro VM only. And the second property is that these micro VMs see the world um, in a perfect implementation of the principle of least privilege, which basically means this. When you browse to Facebook, what files do you mean in, need in your file system? You need one. You need the cookie for Facebook, right? When you open a PDF document, what files do you need in the file system? You need one. You need so the PDF document. So basically what you're saying is the web as we know it, the website-centric user experience is fundamentally flawed with the current user behavior of browser-based navigation and oh. interaction. Every time you go anywhere untrustworthy, anytime you plug a USB key in, anytime you click on an attachment, anytime you go anywhere on the web, you are interacting with stuff of unknown trustworthiness. So that's where virtualization is an example. I'm generally speaking now. I'm oversimplifying just to kind of understand this. You can add value. So what you're saying is you're doing some clever things around that trust point. Yes. And wrapping some tech around it to isolate it yes. where it is and do something or protect it. But, but it also based on, based on a key assumption, which is that you cannot detect the unknown attack. 
See, the endpoint security industry today says, yeah, put my AV stuff in your operating system, it'll find the bad guys. It doesn't, because the attacker is smart enough to evade them, right? So endpoint security is a complete waste of time. Um, and you know, why do you patch your operating systems anyway? You patch them because they're vulnerable. So if you look at the, think about the data center before VMware, right? People installed software on servers, they inst installed applications on top of that, and, you know, and then they stuck a server in a rack and all that. But now they're all agile, cool, hip, power sensitive, green, highly available and dynamic, and therefore strategic. Look at the desktop practices. They are horrible, menial, grungy, manual tasks, which are not strategic. They're outdated. Updated. So one of the things that we've been talking about on theCUBE here on SiliconANGLE and on Wikibon is this notion of a, a modern era. Yeah. Like a modern era of baseball, there's no doping, there's no steroids uh, and whatnot. So, so tell me your definition, your view. I mean, there's nearly no definition yet. We're introducing this concept of data infrastructure and obviously you've got big data. In the modern era going forward, you're a CTO, you're out doing some cutting edge design, redesigning of use cases. What does the modern era need to look like? from uh, up and down the stack? Well, the modern era needs to be one in which the enterprise can safely empower the user. You see, if you look at the world that I described, the only thing that IT can do is lock things down. But by the way, you still can't protect against the RSA attack, which was an application layer attack. And so, IT is, becomes the barrier between me and productivity, which means that I'm dead set on dragging all their stuff into Dropbox or whatever I can do, right? And so the big problem is to empower users who are more technically savvy, let them get on and do stuff, and still protect, right? Now, notice that an attack on my PC is an attack on me too, because it's going to send spam to my wife or whatever else it happens to be. So the big, the big challenge is to allow us to walk this line between you know, where we have to legislate, which is IT, and where we can empower, and people want to be empowered. They want to be empowered when they're working. So I've been doing some research around the low-level uh, virtual machine compiler infrastructure at the University of uh, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And it's the concept of, I don't want to say memory management, that's kind of like a bad, not a direct analogy, but yeah. back in the old days when you wrote code, you know, whether you were doing assembler or C or the hardcore low-level programming, you know, you had to do memory management, right? That deal with that. But now with, with the virtual machines, programs need this. So it's a really cool kind of direction where programs have, in essence, a, <laughs> their own virtual machines to work with each other. So it gets low level. This is kind of a, a concept that points to what you're talking about, which is as new technologies that are being developed that can actually de deploy the kind of security, the kind yes. of orchestration. So, you know. Is that something around you're thinking around? It, it kind of is. Uh, that is another way you could say this, look, there are all sorts of application sandboxes out there, right? So the, the problem with sandbox, here's a good example of a sandbox, would be Chrome, the browser Chrome, right? The problem is that they have to protect the kernel from a user space process, and that means protecting more than 2,000 Windows system calls, which means they've got to hook every one of those and land it somewhere safe. And that's a huge amount of new code that they've got to write. They've got to remain compatible with everything that ever ran and not introduce any more vulnerabilities. And so the only thing you can say about Chrome is they're doing a reasonably good job. They've been at it for 14 years, and there are still new zero days, okay? So, and it'll only ever work for the browser. The question is, what, what could you use as a general purpose isolation technology that is simple, has a tiny code base, and serves any application? Okay, that's the requirement, and that's what we're building. So when you're obviously in beta or alpha, I don't know where you are on the product side, but you guys are out doing some work, talking to customers and suppliers or whatnot. Yeah. When you, when you walk into that first conversation, hi, I'm Simon, glad to meet you. Bottom line, here's what we do. How do you, how does that go? I mean, elevator pitch, whatever, the, that first, you know, here's what we do. What do you, how do you describe it? So do you use the RSA hack as an example? Because it's kind of complex. How do you actually, personalize Actually, you know, that? every large enterprise is being actively targeted. And right now we are talking to large enterprises, not to All large enterprises market are, are being that targeted, would you say? Ev every large enterprise is being actively targeted by Hackers. persistent malware, yes. Yeah. And they all get it. Every single CISO out there gets it in, in a heartbeat. They know that they cannot secure the endpoints. And by the way, this, this applies not only to PCs and Macs and so on, it's got to apply to mobile devices like tablets, right? Otherwise, you know, how not, can you? This is not a nice to have, this is a strategic imperative on all enterprises. It's the right way to build software, absolutely. Make, okay, make okay. software in, in a way which is resilient to the fact that we as humans are going to make mistakes. All right, so how, talk about the company now. How many people are working 50 there? 50 people. 50 yeah. funding? 
Uh, 30, 36 and a half million in. A couple months ago, right? You did that was RB. RB yes. round. Yeah. Okay, the investors are Andreessen Horowitz, Ignition, and Highland. Bin. Frank Cartali? Yes. Frank. Okay, yeah. cool. Peter hey, Levine. Frank. And, um, and then um, Highland. Highland Capital. Yes. And then we also took strategic investment from Intel. Okay, good investors. Simon Crosby, um, congratulations. Final uh, comment, I'd like you to just share with the folks the, uh, the new VMware. As VMware comes out and, and, and the torch is passed to Pat Gelsinger, who, uh, you know, he marches to the cadence of Moore's, Moore's Law. He's going to try to bring that to the application side of the business. Yeah. Um, you've known Pat, you said you used to work for him. Um, what's your take on Pat and his, you know, Pat's in the tor taking the torch from Paul? It's a nice yeah. handoff and obvious there was no issues there. It was just obviously all part of the family. What's your oh, take absolutely. on that? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Look, Pat, I think the will of Pat, I think he's a fabulous leader. He's a a, a, a leader who leads from the front, he's a rallying point for anybody. He has bring great vision and great energy to the job. I think he's a terrific guy. And I think VMware's going, to, going great. So, I, you know, my, I'd say that this whole cloud thing in the enterprise, you know, it's, it hasn't really started yet. Yep, you know, I people agree. are still doing more server of it, and that's fine. It's just a process we've got to take people through. And, and I think we all underestimated the rate at which that would happen. Yeah, and yeah. SSDs kind of help keep things in on-prem because yes. you can do stuff with Flash now that's cooler yeah. than three, four years but, ago. But I think also the, the VMware acquisition of Nasir is very important because you know there's a big public cloud out there and, and Nasir is going to be big in that. Okay, so you're part of the Clouderati, which I think I'm a member of. I don't think I've yet qualified. Sam, Jay, if you're out there watching, uh, I think you admin, get me on the Clouderati so I get on there. But to the Clouderati, you obviously are very active. I watch the conversations. Um, OpenStack. Yes. Okay. VMware announced they're going to join OpenStack. Uh, Nasira, I know, was you know very much involved in that. Um, so I think they're backdooring in through Nasira, from what uh, some of my sources tell me. But openly, OpenStack was kind of this land grab. Uh, everyone's jumping in, kind of like a big orgy of, of tech companies trying to put a stake in the ground for cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be changing. What's your take on OpenStack? Well, so just before we get there, I think the big message from from VMworld, this, this starting today, is this. Look, they've embrace stuff bigger than VMware, generally, right? They're going to manage infrastructure other than just VMware ESX environments. It's going to manage Hyper-V and Xen and everything else, right? So it's basically VMware saying, hey, we're it. Now we can do all this other stuff too. And part of that is also reach into other forms of cloud. That is, it's a recognition that there'll be other cloud infrastructures out there, which I think is... Or multi-cloud, as they say. Yeah, or multi-cloud. That's yeah. their marketing. Right, and that's fine. So this is VMware growing up growing up to the point where they say, look, you know, we're, we're kind of it in the enterprise, which is absolutely true, and now we can set our sights on bigger, bigger worlds. So, so thinking think bigger, not just you know, myopic VMware-centric. Yeah. And, and, and so I think you know, that's natural, that's what you'd expect from them. OpenStack, you know, come along fine. Um, I think the business model for the OpenStack players remains somewhat murky. Um, but nonetheless, it's an extremely strategic piece of software for the entire industry because it can move everybody forward, you know, very, very fast. Yeah. I, I think. I and you were involved in a lot of that with Zen. I mean, you were the hypervisor. Yes. You were powering Amazon, so you know that game. Yes. I, I, but I think, it's, I think it's very important to not ever say OpenStack gets everybody to parity with Amazon. You don't get there, right? For Amazon, you get 25 plus services. You know, with, with OpenStack, you're going to get the equivalent of EC2, EBS. And, um, and S3. Okay, great. And, and maybe a bit more. In other words, you're going to get VMs as a service. You're not going to get Dynam yeah. no, Dynamo DB it's a developer and all the other kit. stuff. It's a developer kit, it's in an, a way. It's an open source VMs as a service kit. Yeah. And that's fine. And, and that's, that's what doing they great. And that's what they want. That's what they want. Yep. Yeah. That's what I think wants. it's a good strategy. That's table stakes. So it's all good. And I think the OpenStack community is running well. The, you know, the, the, it has a new board and, and it has a lot of energy behind it, so it's all great. All right, we're here with Simon Crosby, legend in the industry, great guy, always great to chat with him. He goes back to Zen, Citrix, now back on his, on his feet as an entrepreneur, getting his uh, hands dirty, building the company, leading a set of troops. Uh, final question before we go to break and go to some news from uh, Chris and Nicole is, what's your goals for the year? Obviously, you've got a product announcement. Just take us through the Simon you know, 20 mile stare out over the next year. So whenever you do the software to an enterprise, you, know, you could, they don't consume it on day one and then suddenly it's all in large volume deployments, right? So when you, when you deal with large enterprises, the complexity of their environments is staggering. And so job one is to make sure that what you do works with the way that they work. Um, 
one of the cool things you've managed to do at Bromium is this. No new management console, no new IT skill set required, just works with what you have. And that was a key requirement. We didn't want to introduce more management stuff. Um, but it's, you know, the process is a process of just working with customers. So we set ourselves a goal of you know, work with 20 customers this year and get them to be delighted. And then we'll go, and then, we'll, yeah. then we'll figure it out after And build that. from there. Okay, Simon Crosby, always great to have you. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier with siliconangle.com. Go to siliconangle.com, you'll find that's the reference point for tech innovation. Uh, we do some news, but we go deep. We try to go deep on the tech trends. The next big thing we believe is data infrastructure. We're going to break that down and build on that theme where data is at the center of the value proposition. Obviously cloud, mobile, and social will continue to cover the cloud and we'll see some new security stuff. Congratulations and look out for Bromium next couple of weeks, big product announcement. Simon Crosby here on theCUBE. We'll be right back after this break with uh, some news from Kristen Nicole. Thanks, John. <laughs>